Then we will turn to our next first panel of the day, which will highlight pathways to a just transition and new models for a thriving and inclusive economy. So uh, please join me here uh, on the stage. Stephen Cottons, General Secretary, International Transport Workers Federation. Uh, Kate Ravers, Senior Associate at the University of Oxford and author of the acclaimed Donut Economics. I can hear that there are some people who have read this excellent book and uh, the donut is coming there. Yeah, it's not you, Kate, but uh, yeah. And uh, Nigel uh, Topping, CEO of We Mean Business. And to moderate the whole session, we will have David Miller, Director of International Diplomacy at C40 Cities. Welcome to you all. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, panel. Um, I'm David Miller. I have the pleasure of moderating this session. I'm not Eric Garcetti, as you may have noticed. Uh, but I, I think it's uh, sadly ironic the reason Mayor Garcetti has to leave because of the impact of climate change uh, in Los Angeles. And I think Mayor Garcetti's words are a good preface to this panel because Mayor Garcetti has said we must make an ecological transition, but how the question we have to answer is how do people see themselves and their role in the future economy we're going to create through that transition? And so our panel today is going to help us answer that question. And my first question is to, is to Kate. What is donut economics, aside from a large round prop by your knee? And how is rethinking the way we look at bring, and how is it rethinking the way we look at bringing about a just transition in city economies. Kate? Okay, so donut economics is the chance to throw off the fossilized economics that Vandana was just talking about. It's a vision for 21st century economics because the 20th century symbol of success was this, endless growth. We, we talked about success in our economies as if just growing endlessly was where we were heading for. And we need a new vision and concept, and so I offer this donut, the giant rubber ring. So, imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources. We want to leave nobody in the hole without the resources to meet their fundamental needs of food, water, healthcare, housing, education, transport. Leave nobody falling short in the hole, but don't overshoot the outer ring, because there we put so much pressure on this unique, delicately balanced living planet, we push her out of balance. And this is where we cause climate breakdown and destroy ecosystems and kill our living Mother Earth. So, leave nobody in the hole falling short. Don't overshoot the planet. Meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And suddenly, the shape of progress is not ever rising growth. It's balance that we deeply know in our own bodies. We need to transform our economies so they start to shape like this. And can you talk a bit, Kate, I think that's for you. I think it's for the donut. Don't eat too many donuts, okay? This is the only one that's actually any good for us. Can you just speak a, a, a bit about what that actually might yep. look like in a city economy? Right, so, sorry, more host pipe. We have inherited linear degenerative economies, industries that take Earth's materials, stick them in the pipe of production, use them once or twice and throw them away. And cities are the place where that has happened. We need to turn that linear economy into a circular one, where resources are never used up, they're used again and again, far more carefully, far more collectively, far more wisely. So the first thing that cities can do is make a scan of all the resources that are coming into the city and flowing around the city and going out, and start turning those linear chains into circular ones. And not only do that as a top-down exercise, but bottom-up, encourage the emergence or the rediscovery of the local circular economy. Repair cafes, mending shops, libraries of things, community clubs where people congregate and do this as a community because we love working together. That beautiful video of the, the children picking up litter on the beach in India and let that be used again. So circular. Secondly, we've inherited economies 
through, I think, the rise and the dominance of the corporation in the 20th century has concentrated resources in very few hands. And that's why we have such inequalities, leaving many people not capturing the value generated. We need to create distributed economies that share value with all. Vandana said everything is connectedness. There we are, there's the deep interconnectedness. We need to create ecosystems. And imagine if we have ecosystems of circular resource use. Think of all the jobs that create this ecosystem, the people who need to connect those resources as they are reused. So to me, it's from degenerative to regenerative, from divisive to distributive. Cities can procure, create a circular economy, plant trees, create public luxury. And to me, and there's so much leadership going on in here, and we need to go further. So, Stephen, there, there are people employed today in polluting industries who have good jobs. Uh, there are people who don't have very good jobs at all, who are not sometimes even protected by the labor movement. If we're going to make a transition of the nature that, that Kate determines and Mayor Garcetti speaks about, um, what's the role of labor? What's the advice labor might have about how we do this in a way that's, that's just? Well, thanks, David. And good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I think, from labor's perspective, it's how do we respond to this challenge? It's been a challenge inside all of our sectors to recognize the global crisis will have an impact on individuals. But as, as Kate speaks, and as we've heard this morning, it is possible. So we think Labour brings a leadership responsibility, a responsibility to communicate to the membership, to society itself about what we can contribute. And when you talk about resources, let's think about human beings as part of that resource. Let's think about our members, the members we aspire to have, making their contribution. And if you look at the challenges in the New Green Deal, um, bringing some of the C40 policies, like the green and healthy city the streets, it's vital that our people are part of that dialogue. And if you look at the potential inequality, every speaker this morning spoken about inequality it is based on gender, and it's bring more women into the process when it comes to transportation, but also across all unionized jobs. But then how do we bring our skills and our understandings in the cities? And I think when you look at all the speakers this week, it's about ensuring that we have a collective voice. And the voice has to be, we have to move. We have to move fast. We have to understand how we can change. And I think from the Labour's perspective is we need to have confidence in the, in the leaders. It's not always been easy in this political environment at the moment. But we also need to show men and women who are working today, who want to see out themselves to secure retirements, but also the young people, how can we change to be shareholders in the future? So for us in, in the ITUC and the ITF, we want to be part of that conversation. We want to bring our skills to the table. We know we have to move in different ways. We know we have to respond to the challenges, but we're definitely up to that challenge, and we need partners to do that. Gonna, a bit later in the panel, I'll maybe come back to that point and, and, and ask you the same follow-up I asked Kate about what practically can city do, cities do, but perhaps we can go to business uh, first. Nigel, um, your coalition is a, is a group of leading businesses who understand the need to accelerate our environmental transition. How do they, how is business part of this conversation about ensuring that that transition is just and is fair and ensures that the needs of workers who are in part of the transition and workers who, who don't have uh, good jobs today uh, can be part of that ecological economy in the future? I mean, I, I think leaders in the labor movement, in local government and in business face a very similar problem that we're all invested in patterns, in ways of thinking and ways of working. We're all invested in them. You know, so there are, there, are, there are votes for a labor leader in existing jobs. There are votes for a mayor in existing jobs. There's comfortable shareholder relationships for a CEO in existing business models. So in a way, we're all colluding in maintaining the status quo. So the number one thing that business and that these other partners, as Steve says, need is honest conversations about the scale of the transition. And I actually think sometimes there's a danger in using the word transition. It's quite a nice, soft word, right? The reality is that historically, we've, been, we've had unjust disruption. That's what disruption comes. We deny it's coming until it's too late. Then we have a cliff-edge disruption. And it, you know, it destroys 
lives, it's bad for cities, it's bad for economies, it's, it, businesses die as well. So, so collectively, we're very bad at managing transitions. So I think the number one thing is to get into dialogue, and really honest dialogue. You know, I know um, the, the, the work of the ITUC and the Just Transition Center and the B team have partnered and created a, a business guide for the Just Transition. Number one thing is early dialogue. You know, we're working with the, the investment community now about what we call the inevitable policy response. The science is getting worse, the, the real world events are getting worse, Mayor Garcetti's trip's proving that. The, the streets are rising up in, in anger. The policy response is inadequate. At some point, we'll have to have a correction. If that's not a planned correction, it'll be ugly at all sorts of levels. It'll be capital destruction, job destruction, it's probably civil strife. So early, honest conversations about what we've really got to do and taking some hard decisions in, in, in all of those sectors. So... Uh, Thanks, and I think everybody in the panel agrees with that uh, early honest conversation point. Um, perhaps, um, Kate, can, can we explore that a, a bit more? You know, uh, do you see from the academic perspective, um, are there some quick wins? You know, are there some low-hanging fruit? What are the more difficult action? And are there any examples historically? This is a, a big shift, as Nigel just said. Um, and we know from, if you're from my part of the world, the, the Rust Belt in the United States shows a way not to do it historically. Are there some examples historically that we perhaps learn from to do it the right way this time? I think there's some examples recently to learn from. The Ruhr region in Germany transitioned 37 coal miners out of coal between 2007 and 2018. That's 11 years. They started with open, early, honest conversations. And they put aside funds, and it's only a small part of the whole, for pensions for those who will retire early, and retraining and reskilling for those who will go into new jobs. California has a solar apprentice program, apprenticing people from declining industries into the solar industry. New Mexico has a fund for workers coming out of oil and gas, and in new construction of new renewable energy, 25% of those jobs will go to people coming out of the old industries. This can be done if you take the workers who are going to be displaced and put money, which is only a small fraction of the total transition, into transitioning, then we can do this. And then so many more jobs are going to be created. But in terms of low-hanging fruit, the low-hanging fruit is to decarbonize. It's the thing that we already know. We have to get out of fossil fuels. We have to have cities that plant trees, buy renewable energy, build public luxury, which means moving cars into a much smaller part of the road and giving over to bicycles and carriages, public transport. And cities that do that build public luxury that, why would you take a car? You want to go on a bike or on a tram or a bus, it's the good thing to do. That's so much cities can do, they can procure differently. Melbourne got together with 13 other organizations, the city of Melbourne, and bought renewable energy from a new wind turbine, changing from short-term energy procurement to a 10-year contract. That means internal conversations within the city. So it means the city has to come together inside its own offices and have tough conversations about contractual things, about buying electricity, bigger group over a longer period of time, and that starts to transform. So there is low-hanging fruit, but it means, like Nigel said, honest, real conversations that actually make these transformations happen now. The, uh, I'm struck by the fact you used public luxury. When yes. I studied economics, it was called public good. And I, I think your words give a much broader impression of the kind of cities that these mayors are trying to create, cities that are, that are very uh, livable. I'm also struck by the examples you, get, you gave, because outside of Toronto, my hometown, a General Motors plant is closing. And the workers there want to build electric cars, and they're not getting the opportunity. So it's very, Nigel, can you pick up, I thought uh, um, Kate gave some very interesting examples of policies and programs. Uh, do you have any thoughts, and as We Mean Business had a chance to think about what cities and mayors can do to help build the dialogue and also from a policy perspective, push things so that they start going in this, in the kind yeah. of direction that Kate's speaking about? Well, let me pick up on the General Motors example because I'm obsessed by the need to transition 100% to electric vehicles as quickly as possible. I think we can do it in terms of 100% sales by 2030. Um, Detroit has got this wrong in the past, right? In 1973, in the first oil crisis, Detroit ignored all the signs of a transition, right? As a result of which, Ameri half Americans are driving small, efficient European and, and Japanese and Korean cars, right? Disaster for the industry and a lot of job destruction, a lot of loss of unionized jobs. 
So bad for the labor movement, bad for business, right? bad for the city of Detroit, catastrophic for the city of Detroit. Everybody screwed up. Right? Same thing's happening now in the States. Fantasy attempt to resist the tide of electrification. So you've got um, a government resisting it. You've got um, uh, the, 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 the automotive trade body resisting it. You've got the companies resisting it. Not so dissimilar in Germany. You know, the Chinese are electrifying at a rate of knots. They're starting to invest in R&D centers in Germany. And yet the German government's slow. The, the German automakers are slow. Daimler, the inventor of the automotive the internal combustion engine, has now committed to being net zero by 2039. If the whole of the industry got behind that, they'd be securing future jobs. Because if they don't secure those future jobs, those future jobs will be in, in China. So the thing, that, the, the thing that mayors could do, and, and this is happening, I know in my dialogues with automotive companies talking about the clean and healthy streets as a very clear future demand signal wakes up automotive executives. It needs also to wake up ministers of transport and wake up um, the, 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 the labor leaders in the automotive industry. They're scared. Transition's scary. If you're a CEO or a labor leader or a mayor, facing a complete infrastructural transition is scary. So I think the main thing that mayors can do is say, we're going to go to a, 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 a zero emissions city and do it as fast as possible. Industry will respond then, and the labor unions will respond as well. Can I say one thing? Of Change course. is most scary just before we do it, right? Whether it's the youth leaders who, think of the youth leaders who the, the day before they went on school strike for the first time. It's scary. Am I really going to do this? An automotive industry leader. Am I really going to dare to make this announcement? But you work with some of the most progressive companies. I'm going to ask you, the companies that are already committed, are they scared or are they mobilized? No, the, thing, the, thing that, the thing that takes the fear away is very clear long-term commitments. So when the UK government says, we'll ban internal combustion engines by 2040, Everybody can deal with that. When, 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 when Ola Kalenius, the CEO of Daimler, says we'll be net, Mercedes will be net zero by 2039, it, it, it flips it from we can't do it, you'll destroy the jobs, to actually we've got great engineers, this has to happen, we're going to lead it. I think it will happen much quicker because of the sort of ratcheting effect. So it's scary until you make the decision to commit. And, those, and we always talk about zeros and hundreds. Don't go halfway, don't say we'll be 50%. Name the zero date or the 100% date, then, then, then people and businesses are incredibly resilient and will respond to that. So you're right. It's scary until you commit, then it's exciting. Stephen, I, I was struck by Nigel's point about, you know, in the past we've kind of let things go off a cliff and then picked up the pieces. Um, do you have any thoughts on how, you know, what we would look for out of the dialogue we need uh, in order to ensure the future of good work uh, both for union members who are in, a, in industry or service affected by the ecological transition. For example, you know, electric buses require just as many or more bus operators, but fewer maintenance staff, for example. Um, or, or other ways uh, that mayors and cities can really start to drive this transition so it's a transition, not a, not a cliff. So, I, I kind of, we're sitting on a panel and we're bringing different perspectives, but we agree on so much and that's part of our collective challenge. Where do we agree? So how do we move union leaders from denying there's a crisis into being part of the solution? Well, we've got to start following strong mayors who commit policy, money, re-education, redeployment, re-opportunity. We've got to look at the gaps in our society, particularly in cities, to respond to some of the other questions. Because it's not just a climate change challenge, it's a future of work challenge, it's an inequality challenge, it's an age issue, and it's a gender policy. So for us, practical steps is, where do we take the first step? You can move any union leader when you can show them it's not just words, it's really going to happen. And that's why we're here, because we believe the leaders of the C40 are genuinely taking those steps. And once one starts, we can move everybody else. Our commitment is sharing best practice. Instead of being competitive, we're back to that linear conversation. Let's share best practice. It's not an economic advantage anymore. It's a responsibility to protect each other. And, and you know, we can talk about precarious work and how will you build the right operators to run your future cities with our public transport campaigns sponsored by the mayors in a round table strategy. And that for us is utterly critical. So, you know, there's a lot of common ground. Where do we sign up? How do we, you know, coalition of the willing. Let's move the first batch of people. I love the idea that we have a deadline, that we can work to a process. 
and that we deliver strong things for the working men and women and we give them confidence they have a say about this. It's not just a fear. So for me, where do we, where do we sign up? How do we move it? So I want to pick up on what you just said about precarious work because I think one of the things that's come out from this panel is if we think ahead and have a dialogue, we can do some of the things that Kate was talking about that happened in Germany, for example, around workers who are already in industries that are impacted, who are unionized and have some collective power. What do we do about the workers who today have very little power? We know that climate change is unfair. It in, impacts the least well-off and it was caused by uh, the most well-off. But any thoughts uh, from a business perspective, perhaps Nigel or Kate from economics perspective, anybody jump in. How do we include them in the conversation as we try to build models uh, for the, the workers who are affected, the ones who, who are outside the system now and need the future economy to give them some real hope and a real chance. Any thoughts? I mean, yeah, my main thought is that um, we should be careful not to conflate that issue with climate because I think, seriously, there's a risk that every problem in the world becomes associated with climate. So there's huge disruptions coming from um, technology as Vanden was, 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 was talking about. I, um, fair point, but the technologies are helping us solve climate, yes. so they might be a tool. So, yeah, I, I, again, I think it comes down to honest conversations. I think there's an awful lot of business leaders and it's not all of them, and we're, so we're all agreeing, but not all business leaders and not all union leaders and not all economists agree, right? But so, all mayors. But all mayors agree, Fantastic. of course. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely fabulous. Um, you know, there, 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 are, there are aspects of, you know, one of the things that has been most exciting for me today is I moderated a panel yesterday with Fleming, the chair of Carlsberg, a massive business, everybody knows it. I only found out in preparing that it's owned by a foundation, as are several of the large. So there are different, different ownership models, for example, that, that don't lead to that obscene accumulation, right, which is so destructive and drives, uh, you know, and drives that, 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 that kind of systemic inequality, which actually ultimately leads to political stability. So it's kind of, you know, be careful what, be careful what you wish for. So I think we need deeper conversations and, and there are very, very many very aware leaders in all sectors who know we need to ask some of the really provocative questions and come up with alternative answers that Kate's asking. And those, the answers often exist in pockets around the world already, right? Like this foundation-owned major businesses here in Denmark. Can I add? So I think a healthy economy, a healthy economy looks a bit like that. It's an ecosystem of many, many relationships and resource flows. And this is an ecosystem that is a circular economy. So there are waste pickers in here. And as we create a circular economy, we don't displace those waste pickers. We respect that they already have been making a circular economy and then involve them and formalize and recognize their work so it's respected. There are lenders and sharers and makers and there are corporations that don't try to control their own materials and their own supply chain. They recognize we'll only have a thriving circular economy if it's an ecosystem. So the city can bring all those players together in the plastics industry, in electronics, in waste and say, we have to work as an ecosystem that will make less precarious but more distributed jobs for everybody. Kate, Nigel, and Stephen, thank you for your leadership. A very clear vision was articulated today. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much for this terrific panel. Thank you.